All right, we are live, and this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. It is February 3rd, and this morning we're taking up um, a run through, a walk through of S56. You could just leave it there. Um, well, we're taking up S56, which is the child care bill, and our first person to come up to the hot seat is Pro Town Senator Bruce. So, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, morning. Um, for the record, I'm Senator Phil Baruth from Chittenden Central District. And um, as, as the chair said, Senate President Pro Tem, I'm here today to talk about the need for S56, the need for child care in our state um, at a level that we have never imagined. Um, so, I, I think it's fair to say that as it stands now, we have many talented people in the field who are trying every day to provide childcare in the state. My own kids um, were fortunate enough to have wonderful caregivers after long searches for slots uh, and after paying um, for each of them about the equivalent of my mortgage each month. Um, fortunately, they were separated by five years, so I wasn't paying simultaneously. Um, but at that time, which was 20 plus years ago, it was $1,200 a month for one child. Um, I can't imagine what people are paying today. With that said, um, I want to congratulate uh, the committee on just receiving the bill because it was not an easy task. Senators Lyon and uh, Lyons and the party um, have drafted uh, a, a pretty mammoth bill, but that's because the task itself is um, staggered in its complexity. So um, I want to I want to thank them for their efforts getting here. Um, but it is now on this committee, and I don't I don't want to raise the bar too high, but I will say that um, we're counting on this to solve this problem and to help us move forward this year on this bill. So I regard it as one of our top three priorities, along with um, our climate work uh, and our housing work. And the reason for that, um, among many others, is our experience from the pandemic, which showed us in no uncertain terms that if parents can't find quality care, uh, they can't work and the economy can't run. And we saw that in very dramatic fashion restaurants not being able to open, businesses having to go to reduced hours, all because we had childcare deserts, which preceded the pandemic. But then with the pandemic, we had far less in the way of care. In fact, there was even a, a, a crazy moment. And I know the administration was doing uh, everything they could, but for a while there was a policy where in order to keep your slot, you had to pay for your childcare and not receive it. Uh, during that period of time. Um, and again, it was a necessary move to keep the system running, but it shows the level of absurdity to which we had come in terms of taking care of our kids. So with that said, um, I wanted to just offer my office's complete support, anything you need. Um, my hope is that crossover, which is March 17th, will see this bill on its way to the money committees. Um, and I will leave it at that and ask any, if there are any questions of me, otherwise I'll leave you to your work, but mostly just wanted to highlight the task itself, which is going to be daunting, um, but also our thanks for taking it up and working on it quickly and efficiently this session. Um, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. Now we also feel the pressure. Yeah. Of the words. Yeah. So and we're we're ready to we're we're ready for the task. We're ready to get to work. So uh, thank you for coming in and supporting Absolutely. this bill in particular because it is a critically important. As you said, it's one of our top three issues in the mm -hmm. Senate. So I think everyone around this table is ready to roll up their sleeves. Uh, not today, but although. <laughs> <laughs> so we're good. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks you all. Coming in. Terrific. So we're going to um, hear 
we're going to walk through the bill. And before we do that, um, just a heads up on how we're going to go through the bill. Katie, you can come on up if you would. And um, there is a significant amount in the bill that relates to uh, pre K education. And in conversations with uh, the chair of education and with the pro tem, uh, that committee will be looking at the education piece to understand implications for education overall. So folks who are on education, heads up, you get a double shot at the bill. And then, uh, but at the same time, there are elements within the education piece that relate to the child care centers. So we're going to want to take somewhat of a dive on that. And as well, our, one of the questions that we'll be asking as we go through the bill is what effect, if any, does pre-K, changing our pre-K system, moving four-year-olds have on child care centers. So we have a lot of information to gain just on that section. And then there are other sections that we will be working on financing because the policy decisions we make in here very much influence financing. However, the final decisions on revenue and on appropriations will rest with those two committees. So we're in a place right now of trying to understand what's in the bill. And Katie's going to take us through. There's some places maybe we'll stay at the 5,000 or 10,000 foot level and other places where we're going to be right down on the ground level. And, um, and then as we go along, we'll, we have testimony scheduled for next Friday. So next, we have some testimony. Let me back up. We will have testimony on Tuesday around the current status of uh, funding for child care, CCFAP, that we've already heard about in here, but we're going to refresh our minds on that, as well as on Tuesday, we'll be looking at how child care is administered within the Agency of Human Services, because that's also a large part of the bill. And then next Friday, we'll begin to hear some expert testimony, and we'll try to get data that will um, help us understand how we change or keep or amend or whatever we do with the bill so we can get it out as, I'm not going to say quickly, but as comprehensively as possible. So what's the process for, get, for people to uh, get to testify? Well, if you have someone who wants to testify, um, just send a note to Alex and to me, it's copy, and what, what we'll do is we'll look at how many, if it's someone who's working in child care or a parent, we'll make sure we have a good uh, mix of folks, and yeah, that'll be great. Okay. And I will say, I, I, I should back up again further, go back to the summer and the fall, because Senator Hardy's worked very hard on this bill. And we've worked together on it. And there are parts that we each absolutely love and parts that we're a little hesitant about. But that's what a bill is. And I think as we go forward, we'll be trying to fine tune it so we all have something that we can be proud of and that will help improve child care in the state. We're here. OK. Good morning, Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Council. Um, so as you may have noticed, this is quite a lengthy bill. Um, before we actually look at the language of the bill, I'm going to bring you to a document I put together that gives a very high level overview of the different parts of the bill so you can sort of understand how the bill is structured. So let me share my screen of that document. Okay. So you'll see as you go through the bill, there are these um, asterisks with different topic headings. That doesn't officially become part of the law. Those are called reader assistance headings. So that's just to sort of ground you in what part of the bill we're looking at, because all sort of like sections are grouped together. So in the first, under the first reader heading, which is agency of education structure and pre-kindergarten, we're looking um, 
uh, provisions that affect the agency of education, that affect the pre-K program, which is in Title 16, the education title. Um, specifically, in those first 11 sections, um, there's language that establishes a second deputy secretary position with the agency of education. There's currently one, and this would add the second. Um, this language in these sections replaces the existing universal pre-kindergarten program with a public pre-kindergarten education program for children who are uh, four years of age. And this would begin in fiscal year 25. So this is a year out. Um, and we'll talk about this more when we look at the bill. This part of the bill um, includes a number of sections that are conforming changes to reflect the fact um, that there's a name change in this uh, pre-K program and also um, changes in other places in Title 16 that have to be made as a result of um, making the changes to the pre-K program. And then there's a rulemaking section at the end of this part, and it requires the Agency of Education and the Department for Children and Families in consultation with Building Bright Futures to amend rules to reflect programmatic pre-kindergarten changes. Right now, DCF and AOE jointly administer universal pre-K, uh, which means they have a joint rulemaking process. So a lot that's happening in that section is pulling um, that joint management or joint administration apart. So the authority for the rulemaking will lie with the agency of education. So that's the first part of the bill. The second part of the bill is property tax exemption, property used by a child care provider. This is only three section long, excuse me, only three sections long, but it establishes a property tax exemption for property that's used by a, a child to provide child care services. So that might be somebody who's operating um, a program within their home or it could be a business that's providing um, space for a child care program at a reduced rent. And this gives them a um, property tax exemption for doing so. So we'll look at that language. The biggest section of the bill in terms of number of pages um, is the third part of the bill, which is the Department for Children and Families Restructure and Creation of the Department for Economic Empowerment. What this part of the bill does is it divides the existing Department for Children and Families into two departments. So there would be a, the creation of a new department called the Department of Economic Empowerment. And I put a chart together to sort of help visualize what would stay with DCF and what would move to the new department. In general, DCF is continuing to look at children and families, and the Department of Economic Empowerment um, would have um, benefit programs um, at the Economic Services Division currently within DCF would move to the Department of Economic Empowerment. That's where Reach Up um, currently is administered and the General Assistance Program. The new department would have Disabilities uh, Determination Services. The Office of Economic Opportunity would be within this new department, as well as the Office of Child Support. So you'll see there is an economic theme for all of those services that are currently offered by DCF that would be moving. DCF would retain the Child Development Division, which is where child care uh, licensing and the Child Care Financial Assistance Program currently exists. It would retain children with special health needs. It would retain the Family Services Division, which is um, the division which administers the foster care program. And then there is a um, division currently within the health department that focuses on maternal and child health that would move into the Department for Children and Families. So hopefully that visualization helps you understand the moving pieces. Um, in terms of the language in this part of the bill, you'll see um, there are sections that um, sort of reorganize DCF and establish the new Department of Economic Empowerment. Um, what many of these sections is, maybe I should just back up and tell you a little bit about the process. Um, because there's this division and um, separation of duties that uh, I, up to now all been in the Department of Children and Families. I have gone through every time the Department for Children and Families is referenced 
in the Vermont statutes annotated and made a decision whether that particular duty referenced is more aligned with this proposal um, of what will stay with DCF or what would move into the Department of Economic Empowerment and made an amendment based on that. So you will see amendments in this part from all different titles of the VSA. It's not limited to human services or to the health title. So we'll take a closer look at that. And then the last section in this part is a transfer of rulemaking authority. Um, because right now DCF um, um, administers the rules and adopts the rules for all these different programs. So if a program is moving to a new department, you have to transfer that rulemaking authority to the new department. Um, same thing with transfer of uh, health department rulemaking for maternal and child health. So there's a little bit of shuffling as to who has the rulemaking authority under this proposal, and that's taken care of in the last section. And then uh, we move to the part of the bill on child care and child care subsidies. And I think we'll be taking a pretty deep dive here when we go through, um, but this expands the eligibility for the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Eligibility meaning um, the families who are eligible to receive a subsidy under the program. So this is tiered. There's an expansion under this proposal in fiscal year 24, and there's a further expansion in fiscal year 25. This also um, creates a tiered professional compensation standard for child care workforce that wouldn't go, effect, go into effect until fiscal year 25. There is the adoption of a total <coughs> cost of care model within the child care financial assistance program that would go into effect fiscal year 25, meaning it would account for the, um, the salaries um, for child care providers in a manner where that would be commensurate with their peers working in uh, a public school in early education, kindergarten or early grades. This language also prohibits child care providers from having a wait list and application fees for uh, children who are otherwise who would otherwise be eligible for child care financial assistance. It establishes a non citizen child care assistance program that um, operates and looks just like the child care assistance program, but it would be but individuals who are non citizens would be able to take advantage of that benefit. Um, and then there is also um, workforce retention grants that are um, similar, identical to what was in last year's budget. Um, and then we have effective dates. And as you've already noticed, we have different pieces taking effect at different times. So I'll try to flag that for you as we go through. So that is the high level overview. And now I'll switch documents and I'll bring us to look at the actual bill. Okay, this is nice. This is helpful. Oh, good. Uh, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. okay. Now we have the bill itself. Okay, so as promised, we have that reader system setting at the online too. So that's telling us what part of the bill we're looking at. So we're starting by looking at this agency of education structure and pre-K language. Um, in this first section, um, we're teeing it up to say that pre-kindergarten education has the same meaning as in section 829 of this title. 829 is um, kind of our section on pre-K, so we haven't gotten there yet. Um, we're also separating in this definition, subdivision um, A31. Um, we're removing the reference to pre-kindergarten education. Um, we're just separating out the definition of early childhood education or early education from pre-kindergarten education. They no longer all mean the same thing. Um, because early childhood education um, is available to three-year-olds and possibly five-year-olds. Um, so it has sort of a slightly different meaning than what we're going to be referring to as pre-kindergarten education with regard to this new program, public program that's being established. In section two of the bill, um, this is language that creates um, deputy secretaries 
Um, so this language says that the secretary, meaning the secretary of the agency of education, shall employ at least two deputy secretaries. One secretary shall solely manage the division of student support services, which shall govern special education, early education, and a multi-tiered system of support. So that's sort of the new position is um, focused on these specific topics. And this individual will hold at least a master's level degree in early child, childhood education, special education, child development or a related field. So is it, is it normal to have job description elements in a bill? Yeah, we've been or, seeing that more and more. Um, an example is we the um, General Assembly created the chief prevention officer position a few years ago and that had parameters. So and, yeah. Okay. Um, next in section three. Um, this is language that is referring to the existing universal pre-K program, um, and it is specific to that program. So that language is being removed because the pre-K universal pre-K program is being repealed by this uh, bill. And then we get to page four, section four, and this 829 is sort of the um, most essential piece for understanding the public pre-kindergarten education program. Before I walk you through the language, let me give you the big picture of what this language does. Um, maybe I'll start with what the existing program is, the universal pre-K program. So the- Just curiosity question. So going back just one step, mm -hmm. page three. Sure. Uh, public and, and school employees, what's the purpose for Deleting this section is. So here's what my suggestion will be on the all the whole education section is get an understanding of what's here, okay. write your questions down, and then when you get into the education committee, I think you're going to be drilling down into this so you'll have a, a more more of a context, a broader understanding of what's here. Because okay. yeah, okay, but it's fundamentally yeah, it appears that it's. It's deleting the independent school aspect. Is that? I think I can help. Okay. So if I give you the, the big picture and yeah, then I'll no, answer no. your question, I think no. it will tie back in. Um, so right now the universal pre-K program um, is a sort of, a, a, it's a program that's operated in both public and private um, entities. So there could be a pre-K program in a public school, there could also be um, the opportunity to receive the benefit if you are in a private pre-K program. And it doesn't depend on eligibility at all. It's available for um, two years. So it's available to children who are three as of September 1 and who are four as of, as of September 1. It's a 10 hour a week benefit. Um, and the idea is that that program would be repealed and replaced with this new program, the public pre-kindergarten education program. That program is aimed at four-year-olds, children who are four as of September 1. So it's only affecting that one group and it's only offered in the public schools. So the idea is that four-year-olds would be receiving a pre-kindergarten education full day of uh, full full tuition um, in the public school program. So the reason that that language that you're referring to, Senator, is no longer needed is because this is a remnant of the fact that private providers are providing this pre-K service and we are, will be moving to a public pre-K four system as this is as this proposes. Super quick question. Private does or does not encompass nonprofits like the Sarah Holbrook Center, the King Street Center. In Burlington, we have lots of different kinds of entities. Would private include those? Yes? Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Will you be briefing the education committee on this? Yeah, I'll be working in. Um, Will you hear this twice? Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Okay, great. Yeah, and this bill, as you will see, you might have um, other attorneys besides just me popping in and out, depending what your questions are. But um, a lot of attorneys were pulled in from the office in the course of working on this. So uh, Beth St. James had a big hand in putting this piece of language together. Yeah, you'll be seeing her when we talk through this. Okay. So we have the general concept of what this public pre-kindergarten education program does. The idea generally is that it's a it's voluntary. A family doesn't have to enroll their child in this public pre-K program, but if they choose to, their district, um, if they have an elementary school, will have a pre-K four program that the child can attend. If the district does not, have an elementary school, they can um, tuition the child out to another district with an elementary school to receive their pre-K-4 education there. Okay, so first we'll go through the definitions. Pre-kindergarten child means a child who on or before September 1 is four years of age or is five years of age but not yet enrolled in kindergarten. Pre-kindergarten education means services designed for pre-kindergarten children that are play-based, developmentally appropriate, and foster early development and learning experiences based on Vermont's early learning standards. And then what do we mean when we say public pre-kindergarten education program? It's the provision of high quality, publicly funded, full day pre-kindergarten education at a public school, which is available to pre-kindergarten children either within a child's district of residence or paid for by a child's district of residence if the district does not maintain an elementary school. And then in subsection B, we talk about access to the program. Each school district that maintains an elementary school for its resident students shall maintain a full-time public pre-kindergarten education program, which shall be available to each kindergarten child whom a parent or guardian wishes to enroll. Each public pre-kindergarten education program is to operate for the school year as defined in law in a school district that does not maintain an elementary school and does not maintain a public pre-kindergarten education program shall pay tuition for its resident students to attend a public pre-kindergarten education program outside the district. If a parent or guardian chooses to enroll the pre-kindergarten child in the public pre-kindergarten education program, then the school district of residence shall pay tuition um, pursuant to a subsection that we'll get to next of this section upon request of the parent guardian to a public pre-kindergarten education program outside of the district of residence. If that district itself does not maintain a public pre-kindergarten program or it would enroll the child in the public pre-kindergarten education program that it operates. And then subdivision three, nothing in this subsection shall preclude a school district from operating a public pre-kindergarten education program in a building other than an elementary school. So that means that the district could have a standalone building that it's designating for pre-K four, uh, or maintain a public pre-kindergarten education program within the district when the district does not maintain one or more elementary schools. So a district that doesn't maintain an elementary school might still decide to operate a pre-K-4 program within the district. Subsection C, program requirements. A public pre-kindergarten education program shall have received a National Association for the Education of Young Children accreditation. And then you'll notice we're striking references to STARS. STARS is a program operated by CDD um, to govern the quality of child care providers because this is becoming a public program. We don't need the references to STARS anymore. Uh, in subdivision two, at least one teacher who is licensed and endorsed in early childhood education or an early childhood special education 
in subdivision three uh, meet the criteria for hours of operation and minimum number of school days pursuant to law. Allow a pre-kindergarten child to attend on a part-time basis on a schedule established by uh, the school board policy uh, in accordance with law. And finally, um, the last criteria is the use of play-based curriculum and programming. And then we get into subsection D, tuition, budgets, and average daily membership. And subdivision one, in a district that maintains a public pre-kindergarten education program, a parent or guardian may enroll a child in the public pre-kindergarten education program maintained by the district of residence by enrolling the child in the district of residence. The top of page nine, in a district that does not maintain a public pre-kindergarten education program, the district shall pay the tuition as we've already described. Upon receiving notice from the child's parent or guardian that the child is or will be enrolled in a public pre-kindergarten education program outside the district of residence and concurrent enrollment of the pre-kindergarten child in the district of residence for the purposes of budgeting and determining average daily membership. Just one quick okay. question on format. Typically, there's a definition section mm -hmm. receipts, uh, but I don't see play-based curriculum. Is that outlined somewhere? Play-based is not a defined term um, yeah. in this. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a policy decision for the committee. Yeah. Thank you. That might actually be. We'll decide whether we want to put that definition in. And Why don't we'll we let education play with it? I'll flag that. Right. <laughs> yeah, please. That's important. I think it's an important definition. Uh, it's an important concept. For concisions, it's yeah. Know, here yeah. we'll drill into it, but yeah. Just a but, question back to section four. Uh, some towns have a, a, a part-time preschool. Uh, is that going to? How's that going to affect those schools that are in existence? Um, so, are you talking about a a public? Pre-kindergarten no, program. Private, actually. private we, program. We, one town I'm thinking of in my district has a, a public full-time preschool. Mm -hmm. And then the other one has a part-time. Mm -hmm. Different funding. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. well, I think that's something that the committee is ultimately going to have to take some testimony on and, and hear how this would play out in the community. If, if I may, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the private pre-K programs could continue to exist, and um, they would be um, continue to be able to kids can go could go to them. This with a public pre-K would not be required for parents, so they could choose to send their kid to the to any program they want to. And the private programs, as long as they meet their qualifications for receiving. Um, subsidies under the CCPAP program, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, which we'll talk about later in the bill. Um, parents could still send their kids there and qualify for CCPAP and get the subsidies to go to that um, private pre-K pre -K program. So they both are still allowed and both would still be supported. It would just be a separate funding stream. It wouldn't be the 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 education fund it would be the the cc VAP um payments does that make sense but but yeah and it's, a, it's a good question because yeah. you've identified the areas that uh local schools as well as child care centers uh, are going to be sensitive to right. and you'll be looking at that in education we'll also be looking at that in here so gets to be fun okay okay thank you that's great see. Um, subdivision four, um, pursuant to sub uh, to the uh, other elsewhere in law, the district of residence may include within its average daily membership any pre-kindergarten child for whom it has provided pre-kindergarten education or on whose behalf it is paid tuition pursuant to this section. That is existing law and that does not change. And then in subsection E rules, as I mentioned when we we're doing kind of that high level overview, right now 
Um, because the Universal Pre-K program is jointly administered by DCF and AOE, they also jointly administer the rulemaking process. So this um, rulemaking section, the changes you'll see um, initially remove the Commissioner of Children and Families from participating in the rulemaking process because this program is completely administered by the Agency of Education. So you have the Agency of Education in consultation with Building Bright Futures uh, shall develop rules and present them to the State Board of Education for adoption. And then we have a list of what is in the rules. Um, a lot of the language is um, being removed here with regard to the rules. Um, it's talking about um, creating new or existing partnerships with school districts and um, let's see, in subdivision, the existing subdivision two, um, we have uh, the district can begin to expand um, a school-based kindergarten education program. So some of these pieces aren't relevant anymore with this new program. That's why they're being repealed. The Just one quick, um, if you could remind uh, folks of what Building Bright Futures is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, it's a creation of statute. It is a public-private partnership um, that is charged with um, watching early childhood education in the state, um, providing guidance and research um, on early childhood issues or early childhood education issues throughout the state. Um, it advises the General Assembly when the General Assembly seeks a, its advice. So um, Building Bright Futures, you'll notice every time there's a rulemaking provision, um, Building Bright Futures is re referenced as, um, as being asked to consult with the agency while the agency is developing rules on topics related to early childhood education so that their expertise can be used in that rulemaking process. Um, so first, with regard to rulemaking, to require the school district, uh, to require that the school district provides opportunities for effective parental participation in the public pre-kindergarten education program, that's just uh, to update the name of the program, and subdivision two, to establish a process by which a parent or guardian notifies the district that the pre-kindergarten child is or will be enrolled in a public pre-kindergarten education program. Uh, pursuant to the language we've already looked at. Subdivision three on page 12, to require a district to include identifiable costs for public pre-kindergarten pre education programs and essential early childhood education services and its annual budgets and reports to the community. Again, the change there is to update the name. Subdivision four, to require a district to report to the Agency of Education annual expenditures made in support of public pre-kindergarten education programs, again, an update in name, with distinct figures provided for expenditures made from the Education Fund and from other sources, which shall be specified. So you'll notice that the general fund is struck there. In subdivision five, to provide an administrative process for a parent, guardian, or provider to challenge an action of a school district or a state when the complaint, complainant believes that the district or state is in violation of statute or rules regarding public pre-kindergarten education program. Again, that's existing law, just updating the title, the, the title of the program. Um, in subdivision B, to provide administrative process for a school district to challenge an action of the state when it believes that the state is in violation of state statute or rules regarding the public pre-kindergarten education program or removing provider because that references a private provider which is not part of the program as this is drafted and we're updating the name to a public pre-kindergarten education program the top of page 13 to establish a system by which the Agency of Education shall monitor and evaluate public pre-kindergarten education programs to promote optimal results for children that support the relevant population level outcomes as set forth in statute and collect data that will inform future decisions. The agency should... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Back on this uh, subparagraph, I'm curious again, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around this private public uh, decision, striking private uh, the, the system's not monitoring private, but if private's a, you know, part of the foundation of early childcare, 
wonder why the agency would be uh, so, heavily invested in monitoring. Sure, yep. Um, so the idea is sort of splitting the two systems. Right now, the systems are sort of jointly administered, and the idea is that CDD uh, would continue to um, license and regulate private providers. So the reason provider is being struck here is because this is the rulemaking that the Agency of Education is going to do for public programs. And so on Tuesday, we're going to hear from the Agency of Human Services how, about how child care is administered. So this is that you know, we're starting with education, but we're it's really for staying in, in child care. So as we as we hear from folks, you'll get a distinction between what's happening now moving toward education and the things that are going to be in DHS. So Ruth and then Senator. You, you yeah. mentioned the uh, private uh, schools being regulated by the agency. Are they? Can you ask are, again? are private schools regulated by the agency of education? Right now, under the universal pre-K program, there is sort of a joint administration of the universal pre-K program, where, for example, they jointly have a set of rules that govern pre-K. But in practice, AOE is sort of overseeing what's happening in public pre-K programs, and CDD is still regulating and like their licensing um, child care programs that are offering pre-K services. Child development does division. Should probably should say child development division. Oh, what yeah. did I say? Oh, child, thank you. Child development division yeah. within DCF. Yeah. So, so the right. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the 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 oversight of early childhood education and childcare is very complex. It is a dual oversight system. And it has been for the last since since the universal pre-K um, program was passed, I think in 2014. I think it's how it was. Um, and uh, just to put it bluntly, nobody likes it. It's really complicated, and the the private providers don't like AOE being involved, and the public providers don't like CBD being involved. It's really complex. There was a whole systems oversight. Um, uh, study that was done last year and we, we should get that for you if you don't know we're going to hear, gonna hear wait, so right. i think yeah we'll get into the complexity of the joint leadership on this and we will the first thing we will look at next friday is the report that came in in the summer about administration of the programs and then we'll look at other studies that are available to us so we can fully understand Right. So here. So what the bill does is separate out the oversight so that there's there's a public oversight for the public programs and um, or AOE oversight for the public pre-K and then AA, AHS or Agency of Human Services or uh, CDD, the child care development division, child development division would oversee the, the private programs and community-based and home-based programs. So, so that's right now the bill. oversight, that's yeah. what's in the bill. Yeah, so. so that's what's in the bill. And then we are going to hear testimony from folks about whether this works for them, if they love it, you know, people in from different perspectives. So we can, and we'll hear, um, we're going to adhere to that, our data acquisition uh, process and sort of way that information that we get. Yeah. So for my clarification, is there, can, can we create a, pre, a cheat sheet that shows what changes are actually going to be created by this bill as to what they are right now? Because I don't totally understand all, but it sounds to me like this is going to make some significant changes that some people are going to like. There are some major changes here. I think what will th this is our first walkthrough. So, and I'm, I know, the, right. I, I'm always, I always say, please be patient because uh, you have to be because you can ask all the questions right now, and I'd like to do that. But um, let let's go through it right. once. You have lots of questions. Write them down. Some are going to be really pertinent in here and. And some you're going to have the Department of Redundancy and Education, and you'll be able to get some answers there. 
gradually it'll fall into place. But you're right. There are lots of questions here. That's good. I knew this was going to be fun. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're on page 13. Uh, we're still looking at the rulemaking. Um, and you'll notice in subdivision six, the changes that are happening here are strike throughs of jointly monitoring because we're going to just have AOE overseeing the public pre kindergarten education program and also removal of the reference to Department for Children and Families. There are title changes referring to it as a public pre-kindergarten education program in this section <laughs> and removing references to private because this program is a public program for pre-k four. Um, let's see, this language says at a minimum, the system shall monitor and evaluate. Um, and in A and B, we have sort of conforming changes and C, we have language, um, existing language as the results for children, including school readiness and proficiency and numeracy and literacy. And this changes it to social and emotional development. In subdivision seven, we're still in rulemaking. Again, you'll see removing references of public and moving um, to the, the new name, the public free kindergarten education programs. Um, going to move ahead to subsection G limitations. Nothing in this section shall be construed to prohibit a private pre-kindergarten provider from providing pre-K education in accordance with rules adopted by CDD. So this is getting to your point. So a private operator of a pre-K program can continue to be a private operator of a pre-K program. And that will be separate from what is happening in public schools with pre-K-4. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to suggest that <laughs> as we go through the education piece, we go a little bit higher. OK. We don't Great. want to get as high as the Chinese balloon that's up there, but maybe, you know. Sure. Five, I'll five, move a little bit faster. Five, yeah. So that was that section yeah. four was really the heart of the proposed change. Yeah. Um, right. So section five is um, some conforming changes. We have a definition change to legal pupil. And you'll notice that we're specifying that um, we're talking about an individual who has reached a particular age on September 1st. Um, there is a definition of pre-kindergarten and essential early education. This changes it just to essential early education because something else is meant, meant by pre-kindergarten and it was confusing to have kind of both definitions together. Um, subsection D um, just has some more technical changes that it's getting a heading. Um, section six, this is average daily membership um, definition. So we're adding in pre-kindergarten children. So these are the pre-kindergarten for children. Um, this is all for education for funding purposes. It is, yes. yes. So why don't I move past it? Yeah, <laughs> same with seven probably. Okay, um, same with seven. They're talking about waiting and eight. So I will save that. Um, so the next few sections, eight, nine, these are um, these are title changes. So eight is talking about the public pre-kindergarten education program. This is just a title change. And title 23, same thing in section nine, we're updating the name of the program to be the public pre-kindergarten education program. Uh, section 10. This is establishing the new deputy secretary position. We um, created it in statute already. You saw that earlier in this part of the bill. This is the appropriation for it. And this is in session law. So this is one-time law, one-time money um, for fiscal year 24. So the establishment of a deputy secretary position with AOE pursuant to the language we've already reviewed is authorized beginning fiscal year 24. So that's one of the changes in the bill that would take effect right away. And that 200,000 is appropriated for this second deputy um, secretary position within the agency of education. And the logic there is that even though the pre-K program itself wouldn't begin until a year out, fiscal year 25, this um, new deputy would be on board to help that transition. And then we have rulemaking language in section 11. 
the Department for Children, the Bailey's Child Development Division in consultation with Building Bright Futures shall amend the following rules to reflect the changes um, as a result of the public uh, pre-K education program. And then there's a list of the rules that would have to be amended to conform with the statutory changes that are proposed in this bill. Um, so we have a few pages on that. And then we move to the second part of the bill. So- oh. can, I, can I go, the, the parts that, sections that are gonna be, need to be changed for other, how, how is that gonna happen? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, so we have an administrative rule pro rulemaking process. And so this would require the departments and agencies to have to go through that process. It's outlined in statute, but they have to propose rules. There has to be an opportunity for public commenting. And then it goes through ICAR, it's called Interagency mm -hmm. Committee on Administrative Rules. It comes here to LCAR, Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. Um, so that's sort of the process. And if you want more details, I'm happy to get those for you. Okay, um, so we're moving to part two of the bill, which is the property um, tax exemption. Um, the language here says that up to $10,000 of value of real and personal property um, owned by a home-based child care provider and used to provide child care services and, or um, rented at not less than 25% below fair market value as determined by the prevailing area market prices for comparable space or property to a center-based child care provider and as used to provide child care services. So those are the two groups that would be eligible for this tax exemption. And then we have some language necessary to make that piece work. The statutory purpose of the exemption for property owned by or rented to a child care provider of this title is to lower the cost of providing child care services in Vermont. And then we have to amend the definition of a homestead. Um, it says notwithstanding um, subdivision one of this subdivision 7H, a homestead shall include a dwelling or a portion of a dwelling that otherwise qualifies as a homestead and that is rented at not less than 25% below fair market value as determined by the prevailing area market prices. So we have sort of a conforming um, change here. Just a, a question on uh, property tax exemptions. Uh, precedent in other other retention or incentive programs? You are moving out of my subject area when you move to taxes. This will, and this is gonna, this will be a dive for a finance committee. Yeah. But we, I think in the construction, building the bill, mm -hmm. we thought what possible incentives can we provide for daycare centers, uh, you know, for, and this was, uh, I think it was your creative thought. Well, I think you we, came up with it. Oh, I did. Okay. Sure. Yeah. It yes. It's something I might come up with. So anyway, but it's good. I mean, it's good. it's something to at least bet, and, and it's something we can bet um, and understand if it's possible. What would be the cost, and how does it relate to other um, 501c3s or other businesses? Oh, it, this is this isn't the end of that. Paragraph. Yeah, and if the committee has questions about the tax exemption, I'll refer you to my colleague, Abby Shepard, who is our tax attorney, and she can answer those questions. Um, the short answer, Senator Weeks, is yes. What was the question? That there, there are exemptions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Too. Yeah. So yeah. oh, there are lots of tax Lots of them. property tax All over. This is, this is, the language is modeled off after others, yeah. and it, the intent was to provide. In the right Not you know, no, okay, it's actually, for, yeah, well, there are lots of different kinds of tax exemptions, and it's it, that's a long yeah. answer. There's a long answer. Kind, that. Yeah, but this is just is, as the chair said to to uh, provide an incentive for private um, land lords to give uh, um, uh, you know rent subsidy or you know cheaper rent to childcare. Uh, or, yeah. I just, I'm not a tax guy, so I want to see if there was. A well, we're going to turn you into one. Right here. No. Well, no. This will go. Uh, finance committee will have to look at this, and we'll try. What's there? Okay. 
So we've moved into part three of the bill. We're moving right along. Um, what page are we on? Please? I am on page 24, the bottom of page oh, 24. Okay. So this is the portion of the bill. As I said, this takes up the most pages in the bill. Um, a lot of them are conforming changes to make this split of DCF work. So a lot of the sections we'll look through. I'm going to do really high level and sort of tell you what they do because the idea is um, more to make a conforming change to make sure the right authority stays with the right department. So in section 15, um, departments created, this lists the different departments of state government. You'll see that the Department of Economic Empowerment is added at the top of page 25. Um, in section 16, this is language about who could be a recipient of federal tax information. Currently, the Department for Children and Families is listed, and this adds the Department of Economic Empowerment as a recipient. Um, section 17, exemptions. Um, this is from a subchapter on contested cases within the Administrative Procedure Act. Sorry, just <laughs> Wait, a we question. got a question. Is, is there currently an economic development department? Uh, economic development. Economic yeah. development. Yeah. Um, there's Current. an agency, agency of economic development and community. Yeah. Right. This we're talking. This is, it, well, it, 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 I think you're. Which one are you asking about? Uh, uh, page 25. Yeah. Paragraph 25. And this, you know, this is all about the establishment of the Department of Economic Empowerment. Okay. Well, you know, I, I'm list, not a I, state yeah. employee. You know, I, I don't. So, Good question. Keep listening because what's happening here is um, taking some of the economic eligibility and uh, work that's done in the Agency of Human Services and consolidating them into a new department. So as you listen, we're still embedded in the Agency of Human Services and we're putting together some of the payment eligibility and payment pieces related to child care so so I, again i would say just hold off for a bit and then i can just make one yeah very quick comment. sure to, to senator williams point i think a block diagram of agencies very simple high level this is this is the movement would be very uh, helpful to clarify okay i understand what you're saying so you want to see the different configuration as compared with what we've already looked at and then what's being moved there. And we probably have that. Current and proposed. Yeah, yeah, I have that. Very simple. Yeah. Okay. It's not as complicated as you think it might be. Yeah. Yeah. It's only complicated because I'm ignorant. No, no, you're not <laughs> ignorant. It, the, it, the structure of government is sometimes confusing. So there are agencies. And so there's the agency of education and the agency of um, human services. The agencies are the, the topper. And then under the agencies, there are departments or divisions. And one of the confusing things is a AOE and AHS are, are organized slightly differently. So AHS is our biggest agency in state government. So there's agency and then a bunch of departments. And it includes like corrections and mental health and health and health and et cetera. AOE just has doesn't have departments, it just has divisions. And so in AOE, all the bill would bump up a division director to a deputy secretary. In AO AHS, it would split out uh, a department right now. It would take one one department and make it two departments so that there's uh less there, there's more of a focus on child care and early childhood in the in the department of children and families and then there's this new department all still under the agency of economic empowerment that would focus on sort of programs that make payments like literally just pay for child serve uh child um CCPAP. No, not CCPAP. Uh, child um, support and economic oh. programs. That would be economic empowerment. That would basically be the, the payment things. And C, uh, DCF would be the programs and services that support families. So it will be you. It will clarify itself as we go through this and as we hear testimony. It, it really will. And I would encourage you to go back and look at the um, organizational administrative 
chart that, that we have for AHS. And then as we go through the bill, uh, we'll try to pull out some of the differences and we have testimony on this. So more to follow. More to follow. And if it helps that chart we looked at that when I was going through the high level overview, everything on that chart right now with one exception is within DCF. So it's literally splitting the department in half. The exception is moving a division in the health department into what would be the new DCF, and that's the maternal and child health. Good. It's not a simple question. Yeah. It's, 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 not, hard. it's confusing. And we've well, spent a lot of time on this, and Senator Lyons and, and Katie and I have spent a lot of time, so we understand it, but it's your first time through. So, so, so my, 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 uh, what I need to get my head around is the relationship with economic development. This is sound and economic empowerment, economic development. So it's a different economic development. ACCB is its own agency of commerce and community development. Totally separate. Absolutely, totally separate. Away yeah. from miles away from. I shouldn't say that, but it's away from this. This is agency of human services looking at service needs and appropriations. So there, yeah, we're good. I know. Okay. I know. I know. Not only do you have to learn it the first time, but then you have to think about what would happen if we did this. So it's a combination of complexities. Yeah. What page are we on? The, the, the yes. actual the, the department's listed. Well, I do. Okay. Yeah. So I might go through these a little Quite. bit faster um, yeah. in the interest yeah, yeah. so we that. can get to the child care. Yeah. <laughs> when we hear, we better get to the child care okay. pieces and we're going to hear from uh, the agencies, uh, we're going to hear from uh, especially AHS about this reorganization. We'll also hear from other folks who are affected by it. So, and we'll gradually get in tune with what all is recommended. Okay. So in section 17, we're going to be seeing a lot of sections similar to this. This is moving an authority that um, currently sits with DCF and it would sit with um, the Commissioner of Economic Empowerment and DCF. And as I was saying, this is from a subchapter on contested cases within the Administrative Procedure Act. That's the act that governs rulemaking, for example. Section 18, this is the creation of an agency. This is all existing law. Um, but there's the creation of a new department listed here. So you'll see that at the top of page 27, the new Department of Economic Empowerment. In section 19, this is existing law pertaining to deputy commissioners. Um, so this language says that for DCF, the secretary with the approval of the governor shall appoint deputy commissioners for the following departments. We're striking out economic services division because it's moving to DEE. And we have child development and family services staying within DCF. In subsection E, we're creating new language that the Department of Economic Empowerment and uh, the secretary with approval from the governor shall appoint deputy commissioners for the following divisions. So we have a um, deputy commissioner for disability determination services and economic services division. And then we have language in section 20. This governs the Department for Children and Families. Um, and this is language that sort of talks about what the mission statement is of the Department for Children and Families. So this, um, the proposal would be to change this um, to reflect the changes that are happening with the split of the department. So DCF is created within AHS to promote the healthy development of children and youth, oversee and support a system of high quality childcare programs in home and community-based settings, and provide assistance and support to parents and families. It shall include the divisions of child development and family services, and the offices of children with special health needs and maternal health. That's what we listed in our chart. Um, then in section 21, this pertains to human service board hearings, um, and we're saying that an, um, a recipient of benefits from the um, Department of Economic Empowerment um, can apply um, for a hearing. 
in section 22, this pertains to the Office of Child Support, which is being moved to the Department of Economic Empowerment. So that change is reflected there. Um, and then we have a new paragraph um, laying out what the Department of Economic Empowerment is. This is sort of similar, like the mission statement, like we just did for DCF. Um, DEE is created within AHS to empower families and individuals through the provision of financial support, case management, and other assistance aimed at building skills and independence. It shall include the Office of Child Support, the Office of Economic Opportunity, Disability Determination Services Division, and Economic Services Division. Next is Section 24. Senator Williams has a question. So just, and I think it's an obvious mm -hmm. answer, but the Department of Economic Empowerment doesn't exist. For it does not long. exist. No, the proposal is to create no. this department. Yeah. Thank you. Um, section 24, this is um, from a chapter on a jury commission. This is where um, the court administrator can pull na names from, and it can currently pull names from uh, DCF. And so economic empowerment is added here. Um, section 25, this comes from a chapter on consumer protection, a subchapter on financial privacy. And um, this adds language that um, disclosure of information sought by the Department of Economic Empowerment is um, an exception, and that lines up with the existing um, paragraph four, which um, pertains to DCF. And the cross reference there is to banks and agencies to finish, uh, furnish information. So those types of disclosures are exempted, and similar a similar disclosure for DEE would be exempted. Um, and section 26. Um, this is from a subchapter on fair credit reporting. There are several of these sections, um, but there is language um, about a security freeze by credit reporting agency. And um, currently it's referencing the economic services division, which is in DCF. That division would be moving to DEE. So that change is made in section 26. It's made in section 27. Um, in section 28, um, this has the uh, has to do with the right to terminate a rental agreement. Um, and so here um, we're adding, let's see, the leading language is technical correction and then adding. Part. Yeah, so we're adding DE where we're adding DCF. Um, in section 29, this has to do with the suspension of licenses. This is in from um, this has to do with conservation. Um, so when we talk about license, it's not driver's license, hunting license. Um, and right now, um, there's the ability, um, there, there's an interplay between child support um, and um, these licenses. And so because child support is moving to um, DEE, we're making that change. So you're seeing that in section 29. So these are all, uh, I think what we're doing here through a number of sections and probably we can do the higher level. Higher level? Uh, okay. Yes, please. And then it's really conforming changes because we have this new department. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So lots of conforming changes. Section 30, conforming changes. Section 31, we're switching DCF to DEE. Section 32, we're adding DEE where DCF currently is. Section 33, same thing, we're adding um, DEE, where DCF is also listed. Section 34, um, we're adding DEE, where DCF is listed. Section 35, same thing. Section 36, uh, we're replacing DCF with DEE. Section 37, we're again doing a replacement of one department for the other. Section 38, we're doing a replacement of DEE for DCF. Section 39 is an addition of DEE where DCF is listed. Section 40 um, is a replacement of one committee, one department for the other. Section 41 is an addition of DEE where DCF is listed. Uh, section 42, this is where we have um, salaries of various commissioner positions and 
because we're adding a new department. We're adding that salary um, at the bottom, and that is um, the same amounts that um, are currently entered for DCF. In section 43, we're adding uh, DEE where DCF is currently listed. In section 44, same thing. Section 45, I'm gonna slow down here. Section 45, um, this is a whole chapter. Um, this is the first chapter in Title 33. This sets out what DCF's general authorities are. So this section has been amended to reflect the fact that some of the responsibilities that currently sit with DCF are going to be moving. So there are kind of conforming changes throughout this chapter that maybe strike through some of DCF's existing responsibilities. Um, and there are some places where um, there's language that sort of discusses more about the child development work and child care system work that the department will be focusing on um, a little bit more through this split. The interest of time, I will move through this quickly, um, but it would be worthwhile to come back to that section at some point. Um, um, you know, I think when uh, we hear testimony, people will be talking about these various these sections. Just sure. Sure. Um, and then a lot of scrolling here. Um, okay. And so then next, just so you know where I am, I'm on page 64. Okay. So we're adding a, Wait a minute. Okay. Wait. <laughs> this will be another one that we'll scroll through fast, but just okay. so you know what you're looking at. Um, so we're creating a chapter two within Title 33. I, this is the authority, the general authority and responsibilities of the Department of Economic Empowerment. I have cut it and pasted it from the chapter one language on DCF. There might be a few small changes, um, but otherwise it's the same language. Um, so I've repeated that chapter so that it applies to DEE. And now I'm going to scroll past it. So this is another long chapter. Okay, got to the end of that chapter. So I'm on page 81 now, if you're following along. Um, section 47, we're, China, continu China. Okay. we're continuing just to do that high level, what um, kind of conforming change. Mm -hmm. So tell me when you're ready for me to speak through those. 81? I'm on page 81. Yeah. Okay, okay. section 47. Should have shown as William stop scrolling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in this section, we're changing um, the definition of commissioner from the commissioner of DCF to be the commissioner of economic empowerment. Maybe I should find my own page 81 and I'll tell you what program this is. This was Reach First. So that makes sense because Reach First is moving to DEE. Um, next, we have that same change in section 1101, and I believe this is Reach Up. And then in section 49, we're also making the change to DEE because this is the reach up program, which would be moving. In section 50, 12, section 1201, this is reach ahead. So again, makes sense that we're changing it to economic empowerment. Um, in section 51, this is aid to the age, age blind and disabled. Um, so that is moving to DEE. Section 52 is the same thing. Section 53 is the same thing. Section 54 is the same thing. They're all, those sections are all in the same chapter. Um, next we have SNAP. SNAP would be moving to, SNAP is Supplemental Nutrition for Assistance, uh, assistance Program. That would be moving to the Department of Economic Empowerment under this proposal. Uh, we have two sections on SNAP. Then we have um, section 57. This is a Medicaid section um, looking at eligibility. Um, so this is moving to Department of Economic Empowerment. 
Section 58. This is the general assistance program, which would be administered by the Department of Economic Empowerment. So that is a conforming change there. Same thing in Section 59. Uh, section 60, rental or mortgage urge. This is also GA, general assistance. So we're updating the commissioner who is responsible for that program. Uh, 61 is the same change from the general assistance program. Um, 62 has to do with the bur um, burials at public expense. This has been administered by DCF. This would move to Department of Economic Empowerment. Uh, payment to fuel suppliers, same thing. This would be moving to economic empowerment. Section 64, uh, enforcement of support. Um, this, this one is a little tricky because we're talking about first children under the, care, the control, care and control of the Department for Children and Families. So we want to specify that we mean Department of Children and Families. That would be, for example, children in foster care. But the program itself would be administered by the Department of Economic Empowerment. So unless it specifies department in that chapter, it would mean Department of Economic Empowerment. Section 65 is the same program, same change. 66, I believe, is the same program. Um, 67. Um, 67, we've arrived at the end of this section, this part. So this is the rulemaking authority. And as I noted when we were doing our high level overview, that this is the language that moves rulemaking authority between departments. So you'll see we have two sections on that because we're moving authority from DCF to DEE. And we're also um, moving some health department rulemaking authority to DCF. So those are those two changes. I'm going to pause there. We've made it to the end of that very big part. Are there any questions or are you ready to move into childcare? There are absolutely zero questions. No, there there certainly are questions, but I think we understand that there's conforming language sure. and that we're going to hear testimony from a number of folks regarding the restructuring piece, the governance piece. Yeah. Okay. Any any questions? Can I make a comment? Sure. Because it feels like we're climbing Everest mm -hmm. right now. And I, I mean, I just, I have to say it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is huge. And I can't imagine the amount of work that went into this and thought and um, empathy and all kinds of other things. But it's really impressive today. Well, we'll see how far we can get with it. I mean, the goal here is quality, high quality child care. If we can do all of this as well at the same time as part of that, that'll be a, a huge, um, that'll be top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we'll just see what we can do. Okay. And Katie really is the person to say thank you for the heavy mm -hmm. work. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of work. Okay, so we're moving on to a new part. So we're no longer talking about this split between divisions. We're talking about child care and child care subsidies. So we're on page 96. Yes, we've moved right along. Finally got to child care. That was good. Okay, so the first section in this bill, I should set us up here. The next two sections amend the same statutory section. They take effect in different dates. So this section 69 would take effect fiscal year 24. The next section, section 70, takes effect um, fiscal year 25. So when we say that we're sort of tiering when childcare financial assistance um, is increased, this is where it's happening. So first, effective this year, um, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program is established to subsidize to the extent that funds permit the cost of child care for families that need child care services. And there's a repeal of language that this is in order to obtain, obtain employment, retain employment, or to obtain training leading to employment. Families seeking employment shall be entitled to participate in the program for up to three months, and the commissioner may further extend the period. So that language would be repealed this year. <laughs> Section two, this is where we lay out who is eligible for a child care subsidy. 
So right now, if a family is at or below 150% of poverty level, federal poverty level, um, they don't have a copay for their child care financial assistance. Um, this would increase that. So under this proposal, families uh, under up to uh, 185% of FPL would not have a copay for child care. However, uh, the program serves more people than just people who are at 150 or 185% of FPL. Um, there is a benefit for right now individuals, families up to 350% of federal poverty level. Um, this is offered on sort of a sliding scale basis. So the more you earn, the smaller your subsidy is. So families who are um, at 350% of federal poverty level are not getting a full benefit. They're getting a portion of the benefit. The proposal here is to serve families up to 425% of federal poverty level. It would still be on the sliding scale. So families who would be at 425% of poverty level would be getting the smallest benefit of all the benefits offered in the program. Um, would it be appropriate to reference or the sliding scale in that paragraph to say, you know, it's, it's, it's I think, I mean, it's let's see, I think it is so in there. It is. The it scale is. shall be structured so that it encourages employment. Let's see, no, that's not what it is. The, the policy for us is we want to have these percentages of poverty. Right. 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 And yeah, and and then we're yeah. what we'll be doing is asking for the sliding scale. There will uh, We'll be working with our joint fiscal office and others to determine what the scale looks like, and then the final decision down the hall. Thanks, sir. Okay. I'm just wondering because I, I like to go read it. I got I'm you. just wondering where in here. Your... Can I help you? Yes, please. <laughs> oh, I got it. Oh, it's on lines 13, 14, and 15. That's an existing law. So families. Um, where you are. Page, page 96. Oh, I don't know how that lines up with your. Shall we have uh, eligibility? Um, section scale. 69. Yeah. That's section 69, paragraph two. two. And the sentence is families shall be found eligible using an income eligibility scale based on current federal poverty level and adjusted for the size of the family. Do you see that? So section 69, subdivision A2, and it's right here. Yeah, I get that, I get that. Oh. Where, where, so to understand how it slides. Oh, oh you want yeah. the numbers? Yeah, but that's what I was okay. talking about. Okay, that's what okay. I was talking about. The numbers are not there. Mm -hmm. So you or want they, to talk they, should, should, should they be referenced? Like this is the, the sliding scale that you're- I, I think it's set up in rule to allow flexibility for it to change more frequently. But it must reference, like, I just want to go look at the- You can look at the numbers. They are they are on the website of um, DCF right now. Right. And when we have them in, I'm sure they'll talk to us about it. Um, it's not in statute, because statute is hard to change. So it's in rule because they change every year as federal poverty levels change. And so if we put it in statute, we would have to update it every single no, year. No, no, no. And we so, used to do that. I'm not looking at statute, I'm just looking for the reference. It's on the okay. DCF website. And yep, and, 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 they, and the scale is determined by family size right. and poverty level. Okay. And all, so. just I'm saying, all when, weeks into this, and yeah. not no, much no, I <laughs> So when DCF comes in on Tuesday, when, you, when AHS comes in on Tuesday, they are going to talk with us about how child care is funded. And we can ask, Alex can ask to have them bring in that sliding scale or at least a link to it so that you have it because I know how frustrating this is. I had the same sense um, a bit ago, but the rule change is important because it doesn't have to go through this process to get there. You got I know you get that. Go ahead. Generally speaking, though, as we speak to our constituents, was the goal to stay within or around or under 10% of income? Was that, was there a general goal? Yeah. So, yeah, 
the Act 45 um, set up a goal of 10%, and the scale um, is is uh, sort of so, some families at the lower end of the scale pay less than 10%, and as you move up, the percentage increases. But on average, it's around the, the goal is to stay around 10%. And you'll see later in the bill that the subsidies themselves increase based on the cost of care. Yep. So what you find is exactly what Senator Hardy has said. So you have 10% the goal, and then can't be achieved with some of the higher income. So it may be six or seven percent. It might be even lower. Um, so it's a goal, right? Big goal. And we are in in many respects for many of the income levels. You can ask the agency this question, and others will be coming come and testify. We're very close. So this will allow for others to be close. Wonderful, thank you. So joint fiscal can help us with that as well. Did you wanna add something to that, all this? No. Yeah, you're the expert. Uh, I would. Just a few <laughs> not on the money. <laughs> so listen, look, at, well, I can't tell you how many years I've been working on childcare and, and and, uh, and now Senator Hardy now has been working on it for a bit. So uh, you get used to the language and you understand what's happening. And then it, it's all of a sudden, it's clarity. Well, let's see, if we can get there. Okay. So thank you, moving, please. Okay. Also effective this year is this new paragraph in subdivision five, the department shall ensure the applications for the child care financial assistance program Use a simple, plain format. Applications shall be available both in both electronic and paper formats. Okay. Next is section 70. And as I already said, this is effective fiscal year 25. So this language, I'm going to scroll down. Okay. So this language further increases the population that is eligible for this program. Um, under this model, you would have already moved up the folks with no copay to 185% FPL. You would have already moved up um, folks eligible for CCFAP to 425% of FPL. This makes another jump. It moves um, up to 450% FPL of the, that is the population of people who would be eligible to receive some type of subsidy under the child care financial assistance program so that's on line 12 that change okay and then we're adding a new subdivision that the department in consultation with building bright futures shall adopt by rule a tiered professional compensation standard for employees of child care providers which is comparable to compensation received by early childhood educators in Vermont's public school system who serve children from pre-K through grade three. Annually, the commissioner shall amend the rule containing the professional compensation standard required by this section to account for inflation and increases due to renegotiated public school compens teacher compensation levels. The commissioner shall ensure that the professional compensation standard is posted to the department's website. I'm going to pause here because this is important. So what this is saying is department, every year you're going to look at the compensation for child care providers and you're going to set um, a tiered compensation scale based on experience, based on education, and you're going to set that in rule. What you're going to base that on is how teachers are compensated in public schools. So they're going to be looking at teacher, public school teachers pre-K pre through grades three, looking at that compensation, and that is going to inform the compensation scale that DCF commissioner is going to set every year in rule for child care providers. And then this language goes on to say to participate in CCFAP, to be a provider who serves CCFAP families, um, the child care provider shall minimally compensate employees providing child care services in accordance with the professional compensation standard established in subsection A. So a child care provider that 
doesn't have any children receiving child care financial assistance program um, subsidies, they don't have to follow this tiered, tiered scale. The reality is that the majority of providers are probably serving children that are receiving a subsidy through child care um, financial assistance program, in which case they would be um, compensating their employees at the rate that is set by this scale and rule. Does that make sense so far? I think it does. Um, around compensation, we know that salaries are very much based on municipalities and school districts across the state, so they're not centrally informed. And there's often a, uh, a step system, which I think is what you alluded to here. Well, so will the salaries still be at the district level based at, on the so uh, this would be a statewide sort of scale and it would be comparable to doesn't mean it would be exactly the same so it's not like in burlington it's going to be this level and middlebury it's going to be this level and rutland it's going to be this level it, it, it is a scale that would be comparable so they could take averages it's not it's not delineated in here specifically but it, it would depends be on how it's done you know yeah so we so the administration okay. will have to respond to this and i can think of a number of ways to done based on median income by geographic area yeah. it could be based on district i mean the whole number of ways that this could happen or it could be an average across the state yeah. so we're not writing it in stone here we're putting some we're proposing something that then we need to hear from folks who will administer this or put it in place so we need to know how much time does it take you to do this how what what criteria will you use and the question you're asking is a really good question <laughs> I was just saying, just to be clear, compensation includes salary and benefits, so it's it's not just the salary. And I assume it won't affect the K through 12 system that already exists. Gotcha. We're not no. touching that one. We're not touching that. Okay, great. <laughs> We're touching enough in here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just yeah, making sure. That's a lot. Thank you. Senator Weeks. Uh, is there a precedent for this somewhere in the state system? If we're not doing it for teachers, we're not doing it for nurses. Mm -hmm. what, what's another example of where we do this that's worked successfully? I'd have to think about yeah, that. This is probably a new, I think it's probably new. I'm not sure. Nothing is coming to mind, but I yeah. would have to put a little thought into it. Yeah. But it, it's at least, a, it's, the issue here is that child care workers get paid very little for their qualifications and the work that they do and one of the recommend one of the suggestions that was made in the bill that we passed last time with act 45 was to look at child care worker compensation this is one way of doing that there might be other ways of doing that but it there this is really important if we're going to maintain the workforce that we have in our child care centers. Yeah, I would say there actually is quite a bit of precedent for doing this um, because this is essentially saying that if a private provider wants to get subsidies from the state for the um, their work and that the subsidies are you know, provided for the families that they're cared for in their system, then they have to pay to a salary scale that is established by the state. And that's a really common um, sort of thing for state contracts or federal contracts. You know, there are federal contracts that require a certain salary level for certain types of employment, um, employees that may be um, doing work under a contract. So there's a lot of precedent for this at, um, in a sort of state contracting situation. And, um, you know, I think that the, the labor law attorneys might be able to speak to that more specifically, but um, I, I think it's not an unusual thing. If you want state funding, you need to adhere to these, these state um, compensation standards for the people you employ. Thank you. Okay. We're moving along. So now we're looking at an existing language, an existing section on payment to providers. Again, this follows the same 
sort of format we've already done. So this section 71 takes effect fiscal year 24. Section 72 is the same section repeated that takes effect fiscal year 25. So in section 71, we're talking about payment to providers. Um, let's see. Um, there's language now that payments shall be based on enrollment status or any other basis agreed to by provider by the division. So when they talk about payments here, they're referencing subsidy payments from CCFAP. So it's saying that the payments, um, this amendment means that the payments can only be based on enrollment. I don't know if you remember, but we spoke a couple weeks ago about a report that was coming back from the department that was going to look at um, enrollment or attendance-based um, reimbursement for child care subsidy payments. And so this is making the decision to use enrollment-based versus attendance-based. So that would take effect this year. And then we're seeing the same section again, um, taking effect, the changes taking effect next year. Um, and this says that the commissioner shall establish a payment schedule by rule um, pursuant to rulemaking authority in consultation with Building Bright Futures for the purpose of reimbursing providers for full or part-time care services rendered to families who participate in the programs established here. So participating in CCBAP. Um, here is where sort of the big changes. Payments established under the section shall reflect total cost of care. So total cost of care, meaning um, the, the full cost of providing child care to children, including the new um, compensation rates. So when we're saying that CCFAP has to reimburse and the payment has to reflect the total cost of care, this is saying the CCFAP subsidy has to reflect the heightened compensation rates that will be set in rule. Um, so total cost of care, including whether the provider operates a licensed child care facility or registered family child care home, type of service provided, cost of providing service, um, and provider credentials. We're removing language about the prevailing market rate for comparable service because instead we're moving to the total cost of care model. Yeah, we had we had a few years ago, a couple sessions ago, moved the market rate up to 2017 or 18, I don't remember which year, somewhere in there pre-pandemic. Yeah, I used 19, to have a post-it note on I my computer of where right they're there. Right, sorry. <laughs> I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah. And then it goes on to say that the payment shall be based on enrollment and the professional standard that um, we just talked about. So when this cross-reference is just referencing the standard that the commissioner is gonna set in rule. So it's saying you have to take this professional compensation standard into effect, uh, into consideration um, in determining the payment. So that is the change that takes effect fiscal year 25. Um, we're removing language. Right now there's language about this market rate survey that happens I think every three years in which um, DCF is looking at the market rate of child care and coming up um, with um, a reimbursement formula based on the 75th percentile of um, what child care providers around the state are charging. So that language is being removed. Um, language about the STARS program is being removed and instead new language that annually the commissioner shall amend the rule containing the payment schedule required by this section to account for inflation. The commissioner shall ensure that the payment schedule is posted on the department's website. So an annual update on the subsidies based on inflation. Again, that's effective fiscal year 25. Okay, so we're moving on to a new section of law, hopefully a little bit lighter than the preceding sections. So this has to do with child care wait lists and application fees. Um, as you heard, um, a family often has to be entered on a wait list and pay and sometimes pay an application fee for being on the wait list um, prior to their um, being a space available for their child. So this language says 
that the child care provider shall not charge an application or waitlist fee for child care services where the applying child qualifies for CCFAP. So if a child would otherwise um, be eligible for CCFAP, there can't be a, a waitlist fee or an application fee. So just for clarification, this would, to qualify, this would be those, if I remember the number correctly, somewhere up to about the 450%. Depending on what year we're talking yeah, about. Depending yeah. on the year. Yeah. yeah. But yes, so yeah. the, the 185, if we pass this with the 185 right now. Well, this would this would cover everyone who is yeah. eligible. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, I'm just yeah. saying from that up, right? Yeah, so, so zero, zero percent of FPL to whatever year we're setting it at. So it'll change over time. Right. Yep. A child care provider shall reimburse an individual who is charged an application or waitlist fee for child care services if it's later determined that the applying child qualified for CCFAP at the time the fee or fees were paid. The intent is not to, it's not about the weight position of the weightless, it's about the weightless fee. It's about the fee. Yeah, yeah about the fee. Some of the fees are quite high. Yeah, a lot of counties are getting on like 10 fees. Paying hundreds of dollars in fees. And yeah. so, with, and then some people are on many wait lists, but if we make improvements in reimbursement to care facilities and providers, then maybe this, maybe these funds won't be as important to the center. So the problem is there are a lot of wait lists. Yes, there are. So this isn't going to do anything to help that. It could, it could be yeah. the opposite direction. It could. Yep. Yeah, we don't know. We're going to have to listen, to find out what what if, what if people think, how do they think they'll be affected by this? And the question is, how long have the fees been in place? Because some of us were unfamiliar with, with the fees. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So Section 74. Um, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Okay, so section 74, this also takes effect uh, fiscal year 25, and this adds a new chapter to our, our chapter that we, excuse me, this adds a new sub chapter to the chapter we've been working in on child care. This creates um, a child care assistance program for additional populations, um, and this creates a non-citizen child care assistance program, um, and it this actually, the structure of this mirrors what went in place for the Dr. Dinosaur-like populations last year. So it's the same format. Um, first, we have an intent section and establishing the non-citizen child care assistance program to provide child care subsidies for children who are not eligible for the child care financial assistance program because of their citizenship status. It is the intent of the General Assembly that the benefits and eligibility criteria set forth in section uh, three, the next section of this chapter should align to the greatest extent practicable with the benefits and eligibility criteria in CCFAP um, that we just looked at in corresponding rules. And then we have the language to put that into effect. Um, so subsidies for certain Vermont residents. For the purpose of this section, the phrase Vermont residents who have a citizenship status for which CCFAP participation is not available includes children of migrant workers who are employed in seasonal occupations in the state. And then subsection B, DCF shall provide state funded child care subsidies equivalent to those offered in CCFAP to Vermont residents who have a citizenship status for which CCFAP participation is not available and meet the service need and income eligibility standards established in the department and rule. The department shall not inquire about or record the, citizen, the citizenship or immigration status of the applicant or any member of the applicant's family. All applications submitted and records created pursuant to the section shall be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act and shall be kept confidential. Absent a request for information by a U.S. agency pursuant to federal law, the department shall not disclose any personally identifiable information regarding applicants of the U.S. government. TCF may adopt rules in accordance with rulemaking authority to carry out the purpose of this section. So in essence, this creates a parallel state-funded benefit to CCFAP. Um, it would be set up and structured like CCFAP, um, and it would be available 
to children who are otherwise ineligible for CCFAP because of their citizenship. Status. So this is all um, my appropriations money. This, this would all be general fund. And so we'd have to, that's a consideration we're going to have to mm -hmm. have support. You know, so this is, this is uh, above our pay grade uh, mm -hmm. in terms of funding, but it's something we need to hear from folks about the, the need that's out there and the numbers of people who might be affected. So if you're asking questions of the founders of S56 uh, in this in relation to this particular yeah. item. What, what, why not relate these benefits to a visa status vice versus a open-ended, you know, non-citizen status? I, I, just... I mean, sure. there, yeah. uh, there, there are, um, uh, so CCFAP is, is both state and federal funded, so it, uh, it is, it is governed to some by federal regulations, and so uh, non-citizens are not um, eligible for CCFAP. You have to be an American citizen for the most part, and maybe some types of visas would allow you to be eligible for CCFAP. But then there are uh, there are non-citizens who are not eligible for CCFAP either because they maybe have refugee status or are, don't have. Um, uh, their um, full, um, you know, visas, or they're undocumented, and they are they are working in Vermont, and they are not eligible for CCFAP. Um, but their families uh, work and live in Vermont and contribute to our communities and our state, and are not they are not able to qualify for subsidies for yeah. for childcare. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and uh, a, a couple of years ago, we created a program that, as Katie referenced, is a sort of mirrors the Dr. Dinosaur Child Health Benefits Program for children and pregnant women um, that would do the same, allow them to have access to that, uh, that program or a sort of a sister program. And this would do the same thing. In, in my community, um, and I'm certain also in yours, there are, for example, migrant farm workers who don't have immigration status that allow them to, their kids to be eligible for CCFAP. So this would give them um, uh, eligibility to a program that is a sister program to, to CCFAP. So, and we heard, I, I talked recently with the Refugee Resettlement Program Director, and there are folks who are here who've been co coming to the country from Afghanistan or from uh, Ukraine or other countries, and they're waiting. I mean, they have, they don't, essentially don't have status yet. So this yeah. will help them. And they asked specifically about this when I talked with them. So it's, it, it's something we, we need to consider. I don't know what the costs are associated with it. During the testimony process, is it possible to get an overview of uh, CPAP? CCFAP is on CCFAP. Tuesday. Right, but I mean, the, 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 the each visa eligibility specifically, what, what they do, what they don't cover, to have that subject matter. We can ask for that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. Just to, for her, he or she. To what, what you're asking is what federal requirements are there? Has this fit with federal versus state? So that will we'll ask for that. I would also like to request, and I can't remember the organization. It might, I don't think it's CEDO, but they put out data around the amount of income or amount of um, yeah income and money that's generated into our economy every year by um, refugees, immigrants, new Americans, non-citizens, and I, that would be really helpful. My, okay, so that testimony, we won't get that right away, but if you have uh, someone you'd like to testify, let Alex know, okay. and we'll try to fit that in. Okay, we have about five more sections in nine minutes, so I think we're gonna make it. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Um, so Thank Section you. 75 also relates to this non-citizen child care assistance program. And this language, again, is the same sort of format that um, followed the Dr. Dinosaur non-citizen um, 
Act that was uh, enacted last year, two years ago. Um, so this says that DCF shall provide information on the estimated FY25 costs of providing coverage to Vermont residents who have a citizenship status for which CCFAT participation is not available um, beginning on July 1, 2024, the start of FY25, as part of its budget presentation next year. So you'll be getting, this is asking DCF to come up, come back to you with an estimate of what this program would cost. And you'll see in the effective date section that it said that it says this will um, take effect to the extent funds are available. So we'll look at that piece. So it's not next year, it's the following. The following year. Yeah. 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 Okay, next is special accommodations grant. This is a report on this type of grant. So by next January, this is requesting that the child development division submit um, a proposal to streamline the application process for special accommodation grants um, for children in childcare settings, including moving to a 12 year month grant cycle, improving support and training for providing inclusive care for children with special needs, and determining how to better meet early learning needs of children with disabilities within a childcare setting. So that's a report request. And then, did you have a question, Senator? You said, you said requesting. Yeah, so directing. Shall. You're right. It's a shall, okay. directing. Okay, is this important? Because yes, it is. We're going to, people are going to have to pay for this. People are going to have to do what, what this bill tells them. Thank you for correcting me. Well, it's a shell. I yeah, I appreciate that. I just, I'm just uh, <laughs> stating the obvious. <laughs> the next <laughs> um, part of the bill has to do with the child care workforce retention grants. This um, is a repeat of what was um, put in the budget last year in terms of child care workforce retention. So in fiscal year 24, the sum of 7.3 million is appropriated from the general, general fund to DCF for the early childhood staff and home-based provider retention grant program that was established in the budgets. And then, um, okay. We're getting towards the end. So in Act 45, there were three um, workforce programs that were created. Two of them were set to sunset on July 1, 2026. One was going to be ongoing. And so this um, removes the sunset for one of the programs that was going to be sunset. So that is what the strike through is on line six and seven. Um, scholarships for prospective early childhood providers would be retained. It would no longer be repealed under this proposal. Um, and then um, related to these three programs, there are appropriations in the budget for these um, ongoing programs. So this is saying um, in fiscal year 24, that an additional $500,000 over the base is appropriated to DCF for um, funding scholarships for current early childhood providers. So this is um, increasing the base appropriation. We're really close now. Um, let's see, transitional assistance is section 80. And this is asking or directing uh, the Agency of Education and the Department for Children and Families to consult with and receive technical assistance from Building Bright Futures for the purpose of implementing the provisions of this act, including establishing pre-kindergarten education, uh, reorganizing DCF, and implementing changes to CCFAP and establishing the non-citizen child care assistance program. So this is asking Building Bright Futures to be involved in the establishment and um, organization of all of these programs. And then we have our effective dates, which I tried to kind of call out for you as we went through the bill, but they're set out there. And we made it in two hours, whole bill. Good job. Well done. Thank you. Your good really work. I know there were a lot of questions here. There's a lot of overlap with education, including the scholarships um, and the loan stuff, because I know Ed worked on that last year, but that long year too. Um, and so, as I said before, we're just at the beginning. So on Tuesday, we'll try to get our feet on the ground once again with uh, funding, what happens now, and then we have, then we'll on Friday next, we'll have some testimony and from some national experts on uh, early child care and see 
where we go from there. My request of you, before we take a quick break, okay, I know. Okay. My request of you before we take a quick break is to remember this. This is how we deal with information in here. And we're gonna to listen to testimony. We're gonna to listen to the data. And if we can't do everything here, we, we won't. But uh, our goal is to do as much as we can um, to improve childcare. And then there's some things that we're going to have to say goodbye to, and that's going to go to education. And there are some things that we'll have to modify as a result of testimony. So we're at the beginning of a neat process. Take a break, please. Uh, Alex, let's go offline for a minute. We'll be back. So this is Senate Health and Welfare. We're back on uh, February 3rd. And this is Mental Health Advocacy, Advocacy Day. Actually, I think it's all week, isn't it? It's all week. Yes. Yeah, so it's great. And Monday was a big day for folks. Uh, so why, welcome. Thank you. We're going to introduce ourselves to you first, and then we're going to ask you to introduce yourself for the record and talk with us about Team 2. Okay. So, Senator Gulick. Hi, I am Senator Gulick from Burlington, and I represent Chittenden Central. Good morning. I'm um, from Proctor and I represent Rutland County. Okay. You said you your name? Oh, Dave Weeks. I'm a little scrambled this morning, so I'm trying to find out. <laughs> uh, Jenny Lyons from Chittenden Southeast. Terry Williams, Rutland County, from Polk. Good morning. Ruth Hardy, uh, Center from the Addison District. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Krista Chandler, and I'm the coordinator of Team 2, which is a training program here in Vermont that I'm going to tell you about. Um, and I just, Senator Lyons, I really appreciated your talk on Monday at Mental Health Advocacy Day, the Thank you. intro. Um, I am here as part of Mental Health Advocacy Week. It seemed like we needed to fit this information just about uh, what training police get in Vermont around mental health issues, mm -hmm. um, because I'm involved in all of that. And so just very briefly, I'm going to tell you about that. So you're and, aware of it. And so and we do have Margie LeMay um, uh, behind you, uh, ready to speak. So whenever, uh, and we're going to go until about 25 after. Okay. How's that? I think I have about 10 minutes. That's perfect. Yeah. So in Vermont, um, what certified police officers receive that's required is eight hours of mental health training. It's called Interacting with Persons with a Mental Illness. It's taught at the police academy by myself, a uh, police officer, and a mental health clinician. Um, and that's, uh, that's what they get. That's required by law. And then what's optional is after that, they can take um, Team 2, which is what I run, which has been in existence now for 10 years. My background is um, I was an assistant attorney general here for eight years with the Department of Mental Health. Prior to that, I was a staff attorney at the state police. Prior to that, I was a prosecutor for 10 years in King County. And for the last 10 years, I've been running T2 and teaching at the Norwich as an adjunct. Um, T2 is a collaboration between the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Public Safety. It's a grant that's funded or run by uh, Vermont Care Partners. And it's statewide training that is offered in five different regions around the state for um, mental health crisis clinicians, law enforcement officers, EMTs, dispatchers, emergency department personnel are invited, state's attorneys are invited. Um, sometimes DCF is there in the room. It's great to have their perspective. And it's one day of scenario-based training where all those first responders come together and work through the scenarios. They hear about the updates in the law from the, they hear from somebody with lived experience and they hear about the resources that are available in their particular region. And that's why it's regional is because the resources are so very different depending on where you are in the state. Um, it's not mandatory, it's totally voluntary and um, the last few years, I've had waiting lists really at uh, most of the trainings. Um, the state police did uh, uh, make Team 2 mandatory for all their troopers about four years ago when Captain Scott was there. Uh, he recognized it as really valuable to have additional mental health training. So um, I work with the state police to get all of their troopers through the training in those locations every year. And, um, then, well, I want to make sure you know also there is a um, 
There's an effort right now I'm, I'm part of that's a CIT pilot training. So CIT is crisis intervention training, which um, you may have heard of because it's sort of the gold standard in the country for police mental health training. It's a 40 hour training and it's um, based out of Memphis, started in Memphis, Tennessee. It's really designed for major metropolitan areas. And 10 years ago, we created Team 2 um, sort of as an answer to the CIT training because we recognize that here in Vermont, it's really hard for police departments to send people to a five-day training. Um, and so Team 2 is sort of the answer to that, where they're, we're really condensing that information into one day because that is what police departments can send people to. And while Team 2 is voluntary, I will say, I, I keep a list that's required by the grant. There's probably only six or seven police agencies who have never attended Team 2, and those are the really, really tiny ones. I only have one or two officers. Um, so the CI, there is a CIT pilot project going on right now in Washington County that has been going on for a couple of years. We're actually rolling out the training in March. That will be five days. Um, it's, we have um, turning point people, EMTs, uh, police officers, a dispatcher, and some mental health folks uh, currently signed up for it. But what we're finding out, which is kind of what we already knew, is that it's, it's really hard for people to attend five days of training that we're asking them to. And so we only have about 10 people signed up right now. Um, but we're going to hold the training. Um, and um, that also is scenario based. And it also involves one, one of those five days involves site visits where the whole the group will go around and look and, and get to see like the emergency department um, psychiatric unit. They'll go to Turning Point. They'll go to some other uh, agencies that we think it's important for them to see. Um, the Broad State Police does also, they've added in the last three or four years, um, a, a pre-basic training for their officers that I've conducted, and now Morning Fox is doing it, and also a post-basic training. So Vermont State Police has really, uh, on their own, recognized that the need for additional mental health training for their troopers. So they're getting uh, three hours ahead, before they even start the academy, before they get any of the law, they just get an overview of the mental health system in Vermont. And then once they're finished the 16 week academy, they then get a, an afternoon of um, role playing where Fox brings in an actor. I've done it in the past. I brought in an actor, and the, and the troopers have to go through a scenario and talk somebody down, basically, and provide feedback. One of the things that I just want to put a be in your bonnet about that I hope will be coming in the future is um, a, a bill that will require refresher training for mm -hmm. law enforcement on mental health um, cases. Mm -hmm. And this, um, I gotta tell you, it didn't really occur to me until I was, a couple years ago, I was helping a friend move into uh, Boston University and there was a, an officer standing around outside, you know, with the parking and stuff, and I just chatted him up. There were a few of us who were prosecutors talking about him. And I started asking about his mental health training. He told me, yeah, we have to do 44 hours every year. And I was like, geez, I'm you know, 44? Like four. Four. Oh, four. Every Shoot. year. I said, oh, and, I, four and he started talking about how helpful it was and how they, you know, we ha do have mandatory training for all the other tools on their belt, tasers, um, you know, firearms, um, domestic violence stuff there, that is required. But we never require here in Vermont any follow-up. And I have people, officers in my Team 2 training who've been officers for 20 years and you know, stuff changes, things change and, and the whole culture has changed really on how we respond to mental health cases. So um, I the uh, I have a student of mine at Norwich who's also an intern at the Montpelier PD. So he did some research for me and found that there are 17 states that require some follow-up mental health training. And I provided that to you in my written testimony, what those hours are. Would you be willing to send us your testimony in writing? So I did. I, I did. Oh, we have it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. So that's yeah, fine. It varies from like one hour every year up to four hours yeah. every year. Okay. Um, or, or it may be like three hours every three years. It depends on the state. Okay. Um, and I've talked to a lot of officers because I thought I'd get resistance on this. And they're all like, no, please, we would welcome this. We would really welcome this because. And it's uh, for, at the state level. Is it at the state, state level? Yeah. yeah. For those other states. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, because so much of what we do, it happens at more of a local level. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but again, I think it would probably need to be regional because of those yeah, resource definitely. differences. 
you know, at least three people. Yeah. So any questions? Uh, so we have this testimony and we have your expertise. And so this committee will be talking mental health issues, maybe not directly to a bill, but it will sort of directly to a bill, but this might be something that we can consider and recommend. There's a cost to it, but it is a, a well, a worthy cost. So stay connected with us. You bet. You yeah, that'd be great. I just had a quick comment. Um, thank you very much, first of all. Um, I'm, I haven't seen this bill, but I'm very excited. Uh, my husband's an airline pilot. Every nine months, he goes to a training that's quite intensive. As a high school teacher, I had professional development every year. And we throw the word crisis around a lot, mental health crisis. What that says to me is we have to do things differently. We cannot do things the way we've been doing them. And this will be huge because we have so much evidence of what happens when uh, police officers and folks in a crisis collide and it's often um, doesn't end well. Mm. So I'm really excited about this and I, I look forward to learning more. Good. Well, this is the other thing. I just came from a meeting where we were talking about this um, and I want to send you the every year I publish a little thing called the Team 2 Training News about the good outcomes in Vermont because you yeah. don't hear about those good outcomes. No, you only hear about the true. negative ones. And there's so many, there's, we're really, there's a lot of really good work going on. And in fact, I've been able to take Team 2 to some international conferences and talk about what we're doing here for training. No other state is doing it this way with people in the room together at the, at the same time and building those relationships that are necessary. And I'll tell you, there's, there's really just some great work going on. I also serve as the vice chair on the Mental Health Crisis Review Commission and where we review cases and we're still seeing that there's really good work going on. That would be really helpful to get some of that sure. information. I live in Burlington and the narrative is, so, it's needs, a narrative. It, it, yeah. It, yeah, it needs yeah. some work. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna, uh, this is terrific. And I think what we might do is invite you back another time when we're ready to put something in writing. Happy to come back. That would be terrific. And I'm, I really would like to hear Marge, so I'm just gonna- I'm just, I just, I want to be respectful of Marge. Yeah, Marge she has a school, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Marge uh, 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 on the streets. Cold world. It must, I'm gonna say, you look like you're very warm for this day. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm being held by a very close friend by her scarf. Can you introduce yourself for the record and then uh, let us uh, give us some information about NAMI. Uh, thank you for being here. Yes, certainly. Good morning. It's a privilege for me to be here today. I'm very grateful for the opportunity, so thank you. Um, my name's Margie LeMay. Um, my family has lived in Colchester, Vermont for the past 30 plus years. I'm a member, a volunteer, and an employee of NAMI Vermont, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Vermont, part of America's largest grassroots mental health organization. Um, before I begin with my testimony, um, I would like to share something with you that I received from my daughter-in-law as a text. Um, and it will make sense to you when I read you my testimony. She writes, when you've spent decades carrying a heavy weight and it suddenly implodes into nothing, your body, so accustomed to holding, is shocked by the weightlessness. Your arms have atrophied in a now empty hug. Your feet are unsteady on flat ground. Your sense of time slips and twists back and forth, forth and back. Oh, your spinning mind, there isn't anywhere to a light that is firm and real. You are suspended from above by a thread while the world whirls around you. Faces and voices, kind words and touches from loved ones flow past you. And when they go, there is quiet, deep and smooth, yet buzzing with absence. The terrible moment you wake in the morning and remember the possibility the loss of possibility for him, the finality of it. Today, my family's story is one of failed systems, 
struggles, heartache, and profound love. Today I'm talking about our son, our family, but there's hundreds of others in Vermont who are in one stage or another of crisis. No action can help my son now, but we can change their outcome. Today, I would like to share with you my 31-year-old son's journey on this earth. We lost him less than two weeks ago on Monday, January 23rd, 2023, to a lifetime of struggle with mental health and more recently addiction. Everyone who loves him is both devastated by this loss and comforted to know that his struggle and his pain in this life is now over. I'm here to tell you that at every turn in his and our journey, every social system designed to help us failed us. The mental health system, the physical health care system, the education system, law enforcement and court systems, and our social service systems, every one of them underfunded, understaffed, overwhelmed and stretched beyond their limits, were never able to function smoothly in a coordinated, efficient way to pool their resources and offer our family the right care at the right time and in the right place. The result is that the baby boy we welcomed into our life on October 11th, Nineteen ninety one, with incredible joy and hope, is no longer with us. The NAMI Smarts training program that I co teach with Laurie Emerson, NAMI Vermont's executive director, teaches people how to write an effective, concise story, deliver it to you, the legislators, and most importantly, make an ask. I have given a lot of thought to what my ask is today. The systems designed to fix the problems are causing them. My ask is for everybody listening right now, whether you identify as a peer, a family member, a community member, a provider, or a legislator, please feel and adopt my urgency and help me fix what's broken. We need to start over and design a system where we communicate coordinate and make efficient use of our extremely limited resources. Our systems must be generously staffed with people who are paid well, who have a workload that allows them to focus on providing whole person care from start to finish, supporting and guiding their clients until they are well into recovery. As a society, we must step up, stop, talking and start doing. How is it possible that my son could drive to City Hall Park and within minutes be approached by a half dozen dealers all vying to sell him fentanyl because the police are so disrespected and reviled that no one wants the job and far too many positions remain unfilled? How is it possible that my son could be transported by ambulance after a near fatal overdose last fall and then be released within an hour with no one having encouraged or offered a rehab placement or any kind of follow up care? Because he was physically stable. There's no placement for them to offer. And there are two dozen people in the ER waiting to be seen. How is it possible that the only way we as parents could get him into a residential placement as a young teenager was to give up our parental rights and allow him to be placed in a foster home until a placement became available? Because the only placement in Vermont at that time was funded by the state of Vermont and was reserved exclusively for teenagers in the custody of the Department of Social Services. It's important for you, for me to note, and you to know, that we had private insurance at the time that would have paid 100% of the cost without time limits. My husband and I 
and everyone who loves our son is just now beginning to learn how to exist in this world without our brilliant, funny, compassionate son. Because despite investing every ounce of courage and resolve we had, all of our resources and the love and support of many family and friends, the systems designed to help us failed us every step of the way. I implore you to help me fix this now before we lose one more person we love. Again, today I'm talking about my son, my family. Hundreds of our neighbors, friends, and loved ones are in the same cycle of crisis right now. Help me change their outcome. I don't want to hear one more person say, I'm so sorry for your loss. I want to hear them say, I hear you. I see you. I feel your pain. How can I help you fix this, what's broken? Thank you for listening. I very much appreciate this opportunity and I hope to have additional opportunities. Thank you very much, Margie. Uh, we, do, we do hear you and your testimony is on our webpage. It's very compelling and you have offered some suggestions for improvement to the system. We greatly appreciate the work that you're doing. And we also, in spite of what you said, send condolences about your loss. So thank you. And we're, unfortunately, we're going to have to go offline at this time. And we look forward to staying um, in touch with you as well. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. We're offline.